All right. I want to thank everybody who hasn't quit on me yet uh, because of the technical difficulties. When you're trying out new things for a stream, you're going to run into problems. So everybody is still here and hasn't given up on the stream yet. I appreciate it. So I hope everybody can find it. So we're going to talk about American football uh, statistical analysis today. Uh, things you might need to do to build a successful model to bet with for those of you who want to put in that effort. I know most people aren't going to put in this kind of effort to bet on football. Uh, so um, you still might learn a thing or two by watching this video anyway. But uh, for those of you who really like to put in effort, this video is for you. All right. So let's get started. So the most important thing uh, when it comes to a football model uh, or just football statistical analysis is going to be your data sources. And this is the most stressful thing about uh, football models, in my opinion, because data sources are just unreliable for football. For baseball, you have Savant or Savant, however you pronounce it, that MLB provides you pitch by pitch data for free to download for your own use, which is awesome. Thank you, MLB. NBA doesn't do that, but all you need for NBA statistical analysis is really a box score to go very far. You can go very far with just a box score, which is very easy to obtain and scrape. But football is a different animal because there's a box score for football gives you a lot of information, but it doesn't give you the information you need to do meaningful statistical analysis, and that can be a problem. So I'm sure you could build something based on just box score data that might get you somewhere, but if you really want to uh, get data uh, analysis that's very accurate, you're going to need at the very least drive level data, if not play by play level data, and that's the problem. It's hard to get that easily for free. However, there are some sources out there that might work. So for college football, so this video, just to point out, is for both college football and NFL. Um, the concepts I cover in this video are going to apply no matter what uh, for either sport. So don't think this is a college football-oriented video. That's just what I'm going to talk about when uh, going through this video because that's what I focus on. But it applies to NFL too. So there's a couple of free data sources out there that I know of. One is collegefootballdata.com, which is free. Uh, they've done a very good job there. Uh, they've come a long way. I remember when it first started, I was kind of uh, skeptical about it, but they've really proven themselves. And so you can get drive level data, play by play level data, and meaningful data from there for free. Um, but the issue is that um, it's not perfect. There are some errors in the data. There are some things you have to impute. There's some things you have to fix that you'll come across when doing analysis. Uh, but for a free data source, uh, it's very good. It's not, of course, it's free, so it's not going to be perfect. Uh, CFBStats.com used to be free back in the day, which I used to build my first football models, but they went paid uh, starting in 2014 and they're gonna cost you a lot of money. Uh, if you pay 300 bucks, you can get this year's stats, but you can't get previous year's stats, which you need to build any kind of meaningful model. So um, that's why that's probably not a good option unless you're willing to shell out the dough. And then stats LLC, um, that's gonna cost you tens of thousands of dollars. So, uh, and for NFL, I've heard good things about NFL Fast R that gives you play-by-play -play level data for NFL. All right, so the first stat I'm going to talk about today, I've done a video on this before like two years ago, but I'm going to uh, recover a lot of things today, is drive efficiency. So what drive efficiency is, it's the expected points based on starting field position. So for example, uh, let me find a good one right here. All right, so this right here, uh, this is about 4.5 uh, points expected on drives starting from like maybe the 35 or so. I don't know what yard line that is, but as you can see, it's jaggy. It's jaggy. It's not, it's not linear. So I had to do a polynomial regression to best fit uh, the expected uh, points based on starting field position. So for example, uh, drive starting one yard from the goal, expected points for that drive is about 6.2. So the average team can be expected to score 6.2 points if they start on the one yard line. So you get the idea. Um, but it, it spikes sharply upwards starting at about the 15-yard uh, line, which is why I use a polynomial regression instead of a linear regression. It'll be too flat. Um, so this uh, is based on 2014 to 2019 college football data. Garbage time filtered out. So any meaningful analysis you do with football, you're going to filter out garbage time. Okay. Uh, when I say garbage time, there's a lot of ways you can calculate it. You can go simple, you can go fast, but you want to filter out drives where like a team's up by a lot, right? Or a end of clock uh, kneel down. You don't want that to be factored into a team's drive uh, 
efficiency or any stat really. So you need to have an algorithm to filter that out. Uh, my algorithms are basically based off of eight times the number of renaming possessions for a team times one. Uh, so basically how many remaining possessions they have, it's impossible for them to come back is how I filter out gar garbage time. And I also filter out end of a uh, half clock kills, kneel downs and all that. Also FBS versus FBS only. I make sure that this is uh, only between games featuring FBS and FBS teams. Uh, because if you wanna put FCS games in there, first of all, you have to create a data set entirely for FCS teams, which you know it's already hard to get uh, FBS data as it is. And FCS versus FBS games are so uh, mismatched that it's not worth the effort. So I filter those out as well. So drive efficiency. Um, in 2019, this is how it looks. So LS, LSU had the best, uh, both raw and adjusted. So this is another concept I want to cover that I've covered in many videos before, but I'll cover it again, is that raw is uh, how it was without any opponent adjustments. When I say opponent adjustments, it's pretty much adjusting for the strength of the opponents you faced, right? So as you can see, I put teams in red in both of these columns that were showing up in the raw column, but not the adjusted column. And notice they're generally teams like Hawaii, Charlotte, um, and such that played in weaker conferences, played against weaker schedules. So after the adjustments, they fell down because it accounted for the strengths of the opponents they played. Meanwhile, you have teams like LSU that were adjusted upward because they played a strong SEC schedule against strong defenses, and so their stats were adjusted upward. Like, look at this. San Diego State, number five in raw defense, but didn't even chart in the top 20 in adjusted defense when you accounted for their uh, Mountain West schedule, where they pretty much played a bunch against a bunch of weak Mountain West offenses. So there you go. UCF as well. So... That's why you adjust, it's very important, but this is gonna be the only slide I talk about adjustment on, but I do apply it uh, going forward, and I'll let you know if I don't. But pretty much what this stat is saying when you adjust is that LSU against a neutral opponent on a neutral field could be expected to score 2.26 points over expectation based on starting field position. So remember I was talking about um, earlier, I'm gonna go back a slide. So Say LSU started their drive on the 50. It looks like the expectation is about three, right? The national average expectancy is three points per possession for drives starting on the 50-yard line. Well, LSU is going to go 2.26 points over that. So we could expect LSU against an average opponent on a neutral field in 2019 to score 5.26 points, which is three plus their 2.26. So that would be their expectation. Meanwhile, Clemson against the average team that started to drive on the 50-yard line would be 3 minus 1.46. So Clemson would be about 1.54 expectancy based on drive starting on the 50-yard line against the average opponent. So I hope you get the idea of what I'm talking about there, uh, what drive efficiency is. So that's how you calculate it. Starting field position, where does the drive start? How many points did they score on that drive? Seven for a touchdown, three for a field goal, zero for everything else. And then you average that for the season. And if you want to adjust it, you just do it like this. Actually, this is uh, expectation, but um, for adjustments, it's pretty much just taking the average defensive, if you're adjusting for LSU's offense, for example, you take the average defensive drive efficiency they faced uh, opponent-wise on the season, subtract that from the league average, and then add it onto their uh, so basically what this is saying, if LSU gained about 0.4 uh, from raw to adjusted, it means that their average defense they faced on their offensive drives this year had a adjusted defensive drive or a raw defensive drive efficiency of 0.4 over the league average. Uh, so that's why their adjusted offense was adjusted by 0.4. All right, so a def drive efficiency example. So I'm using the uh, 2020 national championship game between LSU and Clemson, which also was the top offense against the top defense. So LSU's uh, offensive drive efficiency, 2.26, Clemson minus 1.46. The league average is 0.08 because it's an offensive league these days. 
So LSU over the league average plus 2.18, Clemson versus the league average minus 1.54. You sum that together to get plus 0.64, and you add that onto the league average to get 0.72. So therefore, we could expect LSU to have a drive efficiency expectation in terms of points of plus 0.72 over what the league average is for that uh, starting yard posi position and field uh, position. So for example, on drives starting from the 75 yards to the goal, the league average expectation is 1.954 points scored per drive on drives starting from the 75. But if you factor in LSU's ex expectation of plus 0.72 against Clemson, they could be expected to score 2.674 points per drive starting from the 75. And this is ex expectation before home advantage. Uh, since this is a neutral site game, I'm not factoring home advantage, but that's something you'd want to factor in as well when doing uh, your expectations and your adjustments as well. Uh, I want to also point out that the adjusted uh, right here also factors in home advantage. All right, but say LSU is starting from the 65-yard line. Well, the average drive expectation for that is 2.289. Uh, and then when you add on their expectation of plus 0.72, you get about three points. So an LSU drive starting on their own 35-yard line could be expected to yield about three points against Clemson. So you get the idea. Now we're going to talk about field position. This is another uh, statistic that can be derived solely from drive level data. So in 2019, Virginia had the best adjusted starting offensive field position. They started uh, on average adjusted, you know, from the 35 yard line. That's very good. And Penn State had the best adjusted starting defensive field position. So their opponents started on average from about the 24 yard line. That's also very good. So. This is a very meaningful stat. I also feel like this is a good uh, proxy for special teams because special teams are stats you can calculate on their own, but special teams is also going to be factored in as well because a lot of teams that were good at special teams in 2019, like Kansas State and Virginia Tech, are showing up here. Uh, so special teams can be factored into this. So you get the idea. Um, so here's the power field position. So I'm using uh, these two teams, Virginia and Virginia Tech. Not only do they play in 2019 against each other, but Virginia had the best offensive starting field position, and Virginia Tech had the league average field position, right? Right in line with what the league average was at 70.03 uh, on defense. So Virginia, for the... Uh, started about 4.5 yards ahead of the league average on offense. The league average about the 30 yard line, Virginia about 35 and a half. Virginia Tech was the league average, so their opponents started on the 70. So the league average sums is minus 4.46. So we could expect Virginia against Virginia Tech to start their drives from about the 35 and a half yard line. So the expected drive points from drives starting on the 35 and a half yard line is 2.27 points. The expected points on drive starting from the 70 yard line is 2.1. And if the average game has 12 possessions, then Virginia alone against the league average team will be gaining two points per game off of their starting field position alone. And two points might not seem like a lot, but it is. And that's the power of field position. Just two points per game on average for a team like Virginia that led the nation in field position just based on starting field position. <laughs> All right, now we're going to talk about pace. Now, pace, there's two ways you can calculate it. Uh, you can calculate it on seconds per play or seconds per drive. And I feel like uh, those the two things do the same thing, but a little bit differently. Uh, UCF was a top in both, and that... That's not surprising. In 2019, they played very fast. But with that, th that being said, the seconds per play, I feel like, is going to be a better measure of how the team actually plays. Uh, but the seconds per drive is going to be a better measure of how much time the team actually consumes. Because UMass up here is number three in seconds per drive, but that could be because they are so inept that they went three and out a lot. I feel like this is going to be a better measure of how the team actually plays, but this is a better measure of how much time they actually consume. Uh, 
Uh, so both of them can be useful when making models, uh, which is why I track both. But just keep that in mind. You're probably wondering why I don't have a defensive counterpart. This is all offense, and it's because defense, you're really not in control of the pace. So there's no point in really measuring it, unlike basketball, where you need to factor in the defensive pace. You don't need to in uh, football. And also, this is unadjusted. There's no point in adjusting it. So the slowest teams over here, you have mostly your triple option teams like Army and Georgia Southern and teams like Kansas State who always play slow. Um, and then over here, you have seconds per drive. You're going to have mainly running teams over here. Uh, look at that. Air Force and Army, two triple option teams, and then running team King, Wisconsin, uh, making out the top three. So slow team second per drive is a great measure um, of teams that just play slow. Fast teams over here, it's not necessarily teams that play fast, but it mostly is, right? It could be teams that are really inept at offense, but... Teams that are inept at offense are generally going to be teams that run the ball more. So um, this is a pretty good measure of pace. And I've been experimenting with both of these measures in uh, regression models and boosting models and all that to see which of these, whether seconds per play or seconds per drive, matter the more. And they both matter. So you could use either. They both have low p-values. Um, you, Matt Stansbury just asked if I track per game or per quarter. Um, right now it's per game, uh, but you could use per quarter in some meaningful situations. So I just haven't gotten that far yet because I actually uh, rebooted my college football model just last weekend, so I haven't gotten that far. Why are we looking at 2019? Great question. I'm glad you asked. I'm actually not going to include 2020 data in my regression models because it was just too wacky of a season, too many intangibles, too many variables, it went off the rails. So I will use 2020 data only as a starting off point for 2021 projections, that's it. But it's not gonna be included in the um, regression models that I use, so that's why I'm looking at 2019, because it was a normal season. Uh, 2020 is just too abnormal. Like some teams only played like three or four games, so it's just not fair to go off of that. All right, pace to points. Here is why pace is an important metric to track when you're trying to project totals for a team or for the game. So let's say the two fastest teams played each other, UCF and Utah State, right? We could be expected uh, seconds per drive, UCF 100, Utah State 106, right? So if they alternate possessions, we could expect an alternation to be 206 seconds. If the game has 306 or 3,600 seconds, then we can expect each team to have 17.47 possessions if this pace holds. And if the league average drive efficiency is plus 0.08 and the league average field position is 70.03, so let's just assume UCF and Utah State are the league average teams except for pace, right? So if the expected uh, drive points is 2.108, then based on 34.94 possessions, which is this number times two, we could expect the total points to be 73.65 if UCF and Utah State were the average uh, teams in every other stat except pace. Now let's use Air Force and Army. These two teams actually did play in 2019, so you can go back and look at that, but the two slowest teams in the country um, average uh, would expect to be about 416 seconds per alternating possessions, which means each team would be expected to have only about 8.65 possessions if they played each other. So assuming all both uh, those teams were the league average teams, we could expect there to be only 17.3 possessions in the entire game and therefore yield only about 36.47 points. So just by pace alone, UCF and Utah State are expected to have about 37 more points than a game between Air Force and Army just on pace alone, not factoring in anything else. So this is why pace is an important uh, stat to calculate when it comes to totals. And I say that because this could be a stat that you could extract from a box score if you use time of possession and number of plays or number of possessions, uh, but you can also extract it out of drive level data like I do as well. 
Yeah, Damon Forbes. Damon Forbes, I did see that. I think Cincinnati should not be ranked ahead of Notre Dame. Yeah, JJA has it right. 2020, treating it like preseason data would not be a bad idea. All right, so now we're going to talk about success rates. So now we're uh, transitioning over into stats that use play-by-play -play level data. So this is data you cannot calculate without play-by-play -play level data. Am I factoring in explosive plays and turnovers? Stay tuned. All right, so the de definition of success rate. So it's pretty simple. On first down, a play is successful as if the team achieves 50% of the needed yards to go. Uh, so on first and 10, if you get five yards, it's successful. Four yards, it's not. On second down, the team needs to achieve 70% of the needed, needed yards. So if it's second and 10, you need to get at least seven yards to be successful. And on third and fourth down, you need to get 100% of the needed yards to be successful. So if it's third and 18, you, and you get 17, too bad, wasn't successful, you needed 18. So in 2019 college football, LSU had the uh, highest adjusted offensive success rate at 60%. Ohio State had the best defensive success rate at 30.2%. Now, success rate, it might seem like it's a very important statistic, but I would say it's the sim uh, equivalent of batting average in uh, baseball. Um, so it's not going to measure in how successful the play was. It's just a yes or no. It's a binary. Was it successful or not? So you're going to see teams on here like Air Force that runs a triple option offense. You're going to see Washington State that ran the passing equivalent of a triple option offense. And Hawaii, who was a disciple of such uh, an offensive system. But what I'm talking about here is that... It does not measure how successful a play was. So yes, teams like Air Force and Washington State have high uh, success rates, but that's a byproduct of a triple option offense uh, where you're, I feel like a high success rate is more of a measure of how good you are at nickel and diming uh, uh, the, the opposing defense rather than you, like how successful the play is. So Washington State was, whoops, my bad, was a team that had a very good success rate, but did not have a very good stat in the next one I'm going to talk about. And defensively, I feel like this is a measure of how good you are at forcing three and outs and how good you are at preventing the other team from nickel and diming you down the field. So if you chart high on this side, that means your defense is not a bend, don't break defense because bend, don't break defenses are going to uh, have... Um, not very good defensive success rates. So TCU, I can speak to them because that's the school I went to, the school I watch. TCU is a very good defense at forcing three and outs, um, preventing the other team from nickel and diming you, but the, uh, what they're giving up with such a defense is the big play. So that's what you're exposing yourself to. So the next uh, stat I'm talking about is points added per play. So what this is is... Let me use this graph as an example. So these are all and 10 scenarios. So the red line represents first and 10, the green second and 10, the turquoise is third and 10, and the purple is fourth and 10. So the x-axis is yards to goal, and the y-axis is expected points. So for example, for example, where's a good uh, cross at? Okay, I'm going to use this. So for drives, uh, so anytime a team faced a first and 10, uh, 75 yards out from the end zone, that uh, team could be expected to score two points on that drive. On, here's another one right here. So anytime a team faced second and 10 from the 50 yard line, that team could have been expected to score about 2.6 uh, points on the drive, right? But Third and 10 from the 50-yard line, they could only be expected to score 1.8 points on the drive. And from fourth and 10, that drops all the way to about 0.5, right? So first and 10, about 3.1. Second and 10, 2.6. Third and 10, 1.8. Fourth and 10, 0.5. Expected points to be scored on teams facing that situation. And also, this is also a polynomial regression model uh, that I fit using data between 2014 and 2019, right? If otherwise, it would be jaggedy. But you get the idea. So I'm going to use an example in the next slide. 
So say a team faced first and 10 from the 75, right? That team could be expected to score 2.05 points on that drive. And say they gained five yards and now they're facing second and five, 70 yards out from the end zone. Well, that wasn't good enough to raise their expected points. Yes, it was a successful play, but their expected points for the drive dropped to 1.92. They lost 0.13 expected points on that. They needed to gain more than five yards for it to go up. And say on the next play, they ran a toss and they got tackled for loss. And now they're facing third and eight, 73 yards out from the end zone. Well, now their expected points on the drive dropped from 1.92 to 1.01. They lost nearly a full point. And let's say on third and eight, they run a screen, but they're uh, stopped two yards short of the marker, and now they're facing fourth and two, 67 yards out from the end zone. Now their expected points on the drive is only 0.23. They lost 0.78 points expected on the drive. So you can see the progression so the expected points uh, per play is like the average of the change every time the play is run. So how I calculated this uh, was that I took every single play ran for the past six seasons and ran a regression model, a polynomial regression model based on the down distance and yard line and how many points were scored on that drive uh, you know, and then you, that's your Y value and the X values are down distance and yards to goal. And that way you can fit it in. Yes, Damon Forbes, you are right about points per 100 yards. That's uh, something you can extract out of a box score. You don't need to drive and play by play level data for that, uh, which is helpful. PPP and ISO PPP. Um, yes, because this what I'm talking about right here pretty much is PPP. I call it PPAP points uh, at or PAPP points added per play. But points added per play is every single play, right? PPP, every single play. ISO PPP is isolated only to plays that were considered success, right? So you filter down the data set to plays that were successful, uh, success rate, what we talked about earlier. So a success, uh, ISO PPP would only, is PPP for only plays that were successful. So you're measuring the, ex, uh, the explosiveness of successful plays. But non-ISO PPP, which is what I'm using right here, is for any play, whether or not it's successful, right? Because the second and five right here, yes, it was considered successful, but they actually lost expected points on the drive. Uh, so you get the idea. Yep, PPP, points per play. Uh, I call it points added per play because it's kind of a little bit different. So in 2019 college football, LSU is number one. Uh, so you don't, that's rare for the team to be number one in both uh, PAPP and success rate. That is very rare. Uh, but LSU is number one in both, and that makes sense. They're a very good offensive team. But notice how you don't see Air Force in here or Washington State, those teams that showed up in success rate that ran offenses that were very good at nickel and diming but not very explosive. Meanwhile, you have Navy here. They're a triple option team, which is weird. Usually you'll see a team like Navy over here in success rate, but they're not. But they were explosive. So that meant that teams did very good at stopping them most plays, but the plays that Navy did hit on, they hit, right? And so you have offenses like Oklahoma, Memphis, UCF. Uh, for when I remember in 2019, those are your more explosive offenses that went for the big play a lot. Uh, if you remember Art Briles Baylor teams, you would have seen that uh, at the top of a, a stat like this. You go for the big play. Defensive PAPP are teams that uh, did a good job at preventing the big play. Um, you could say that Ben don't break defenses are going to show up here. And I know Baylor, uh, their defense under Matt Rule um, in 2019 was a Ben don't break defense. Um, TCU, though, uh, shows up here. Our defense was very good in 2019. We went five and seven, but it wasn't the defense's fault. It was 100% offensive uh, challenges. But TCU uh, gave up a lot of big plays, but they didn't give up very many. <laughs> So that, that's what the defense represents over here. 
So uh, this is a chart of the 2019 national championship game between LSU and Clemson. This was the top 10 offensive plays in that game. Number one was Joe Burrow on second and two from the 52, throwing a 52-yard touchdown to Jamar Chase. The pre-snap expectancy for that drive was 2.84. The post-snap was seven. So that play alone added 4.15 points. Notice how you're mostly going to see um, big plays on here in terms of yardage. Um, here's one, third and 11 from 59 yards out. I remember this play because LSU is only up by three. Clemson had just scored. They had all the momentum. And Joe Burrow scrambled like crazy and threw a 43-yard pass to the 16 for a first down to Jamar Chase. Um, the pre-snap expectancy was only 1.39 because third and 11, uh, 60 yards out. But afterwards, they threw it all the way down to the 16. The post-snap expectancy, 4.95. They added 3.56 points on that play. That play was a backbreaker. That play ended Clemson's momentum and the game pretty much. A lot of touchdowns on here because touchdowns, especially from a lot of yards out, uh, are big plays. Um, here's one, the one at the bottom, only a three-yard touchdown. But even then, um, third and three from the three, uh, only has an expectation of about 5.09. So even that three-yard touchdown run added almost two points to the expectation for LSU. So that's what this chart represents. But what this chart does not represent is leverage. When I say leverage, um, leverage would uh, rank these not only by how many points were added, but how much that play factored into the team's chances of winning. So for example, um, what, what would be a good example? So Ellis, I would, I would actually rank this play right here when LSU is down um, 17 to 7. I would rank that higher than this one than when they're tied 7 to 7 because it increased their win odds more, right? So... But leverage is something you have to calculate separately. So this is just pure points added and not how much it factored into the winning team. And then here are the biggest defensive plays. Notice these are all on third down because another thing that PAPP measures on defense is how good the team is getting off the field on third down because let me go back to this. The gap between third and fourth down is bigger than the gap between any of the other downs because... Um, getting off the field on third down is very important, and that's why third down uh, rate is also a measure of how good the team is getting off the field on third down right here. So the biggest defensive play is naturally we're all third downs. The biggest defensive play of the game was in the first quarter on the first drive when Trevor Lawrence was sacked uh, on the 35-yard line, or the 25-yard line, took him out of field goal range, um, and... There you go. Um, so the pre-snap expectancy, third and eight from the 25, was about 3.22 points. But afterwards, is only 0.76. So that sack alone took about 2.4 expected points off the board for Clemson. But a lot of third down plays on here. A lot of sacks um, and everything like that. Like right here, Joe Burrow being sacked. Um, so... Trevor Lawrence going incomplete to T. Higgins on third and five from the 37. I'm going to talk about that play in a second in more detail, that play specifically. Uh, but that alone took 1.4 points off the board. So Clemson lost this game because they were, did a very poor job on third and manageable situations. Look at all, like here's a third and four that Clemson failed on, third and five, third and five. So they did a poor job on that. This was a big momentum changing play right here when uh, it was third and four. Um, LSU was 69 yards out, but still it was third and four and the expectation was 1.27, but that sack dropped it all the way below zero. And you're wondering how it can go below zero. Um, notice how the fourth down goes below zero because this is where you're opening yourself to territory like getting your punt blocked and everything like that. So it is negative. All right, the punting equation. So... <laughs> Why do teams punt? I want to talk about this. So say, we're, let's go back to our example up here. Fourth and two from the 67-yard line, right? 
The expectation is only 0.23 points. You have three options. You can go for it and fail. If you fail, your opponent's going to get the ball on the 33-yard line, and that has an expectation of 3.73. So you're basically handing your opponent uh, an expected 3.7 points if you fail. You can punt. If you punt and get a touchback, which is ideal, um, that's a 1.73 net point change. You're giving up the 0.23 expected points, and if you get a touchback, then your opponent starts from the 20, which has an expectation of 1.83, but you're not giving them the 3.78, which is why it's a net point change of 1.73. That's why punting's a good idea in that situation because you're shifting uh, the net point change in your favor. Or you can go for it, and if you succeed, you have to gain 38 yards on that play to equal a plus 3.73 net point change that you're exposing yourself to when you go for it. That's why teams don't go for it on fourth and two from the 67. If you get a first down, if you get two, if you get two yards, that's a net point change of 2.03, which is only plus 0.3 over punting, which isn't a lot. Oh, that's not worth the risk. Gaining uh, 0.3 from punting is not worth the risk. Um, so that's why you punt in that situation. So here's why Clemson, Clemson should not have punted. So if you remember the national championship game, Clemson's second drive of the game. Remember they went for, uh, on third and five, they threw an incomplete pass to T. Higgins. So then they are facing a fourth and five from the 37-yard line. The score is 0-0, 938 left in the first quarter. So Dabo Swinney decides to punt, okay? And here's how we can use success rate to prove why they should not have punted there and should have gone for it. So Clemson's offensive success rate for the season in 2019 was 53%. LSU's defensive success rate was 32.6%. The league average uh, success rate was 42.2%. So Clemson's, uh, when you sum those two differentials together, Clemson's expected success rate for its average against LSU would be about 1.2% over the league average. So on fourth and five from the 37, the expected points is 1.278. The league average fourth and five success rate was 41.3%. If you add the 1.2% expectation for Clemson, you could reasonably expect Clemson's success rate on fourth and five to be 42.5% against LSU. So if, you, so if Clemson were to go for it and failed, they would have been giving LSU the ball at the 37-yard line, which has an expectation of 2.368. If they go for it and gained five yards, the bare minimum, their uh, new expectation would have been 2.558, uh, which is basically 1.278, uh, you know, plus, uh, would minus 3.5 or 3.7 or whatever the expectation is. If Clemson's uh, success rate expectation is 57.5%, then the point expectation for failing would be minus 1.36. 2.558 times 42.5% is 1.08. So pretty much Clemson going for it, their expectation if they were to go for it would be minus 0.27 points, right? That's how many points they could be expected to add if they went for it on fourth and five, which might seem bad. You're like, okay, it's a negative, they should punt. But wait, just because it's negative doesn't mean they should have a punt. Because here's what they did. They did punt, and they downed it on the LSU 4. So Clemson gave up the 1.278 points, uh, which is expected on 4th and 5 from the 37. And LSU started their drive from the 4-yard uh, line, which has an expectation of 1.40, Right? And, but however, they did not give LSU the 2.36. So the net point expectation is minus 0.31, which is worse than this number right here. So even though they downed the ball on the LSU 4, right? Even though they downed the ball on the LSU 4, their net point expectation was still worse than this right here. And I do want to point out, this is net league average. LSU's offense is obviously better, so you would have had to add on to this. Um, so it probably wouldn't have been better. But I'm, just for the sake of this example, I'm being simple. 
if they had gotten a touchback, if they kicked it out of the end zone, it would have been way worse than minus 0.27. If they downed it on the one, it would have been about 0.1 points better than 0.27. And they would have had to down it on the three to be equal to that. So really, the only way punting would have made sense was if they downed it on the three or better, which is very hard to do, which is why I don't think they should have punted based on this right here. You could go into much more detail. It's a lot more complex than that. If I was sitting in a booth as like the analytics guru for Clemson, it wouldn't be this simple, but I'm just uh, showing uh, like punt expect expectation and everything like that. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about secondary stats, but I'm gonna check the stats first to see. Appreciate it, T-Pain. We, I will have a stream for talking week zero college football uh, separate from this one. All right, so secondary stats. So the stats I just outlined are like what I call core stats that if you run it through a regression model or a boosting model and you look at feature importance, those six stats that I just covered are going to be the ones that have the lowest p-values and the highest influence, right? Um, so if you've heard me talk about my models in the past, I always say I only use six stats for college football, and it's always been these, right? It's always been these. However, I feel like if you get your secondary stats dialed in and plug them into a model, they can still improve the predictive value, and they can gain you an edge in some way because the models that the books and odds makers are using probably aren't factoring these things in. So if you can find a way to tie these into a boosting model or a random forest or something, um, then you can maybe gain an edge. So offense and defense. Adjusted line, I'm just gonna elaborate on these because I don't have any examples of these because I haven't calculated them yet in my own model, but I could tell you what they are. So adjusted line yards is pretty much a measure of calculating how good an offensive line is on offense or a defensive line is on defense. It tries to uh, measure uh, yards gained between zero and three yards, I think. Uh, so it factors out like how much, it tries to determine how much rushing yards are attributed to the linemen as opposed to how much are attributed to the running back, right? So it's trying to filter out the running back's influence in rushing yards. Adjusted turnover margin. So I told you I'd talk about this. Adjusted turnover margin is turnover margin when factoring in, assume, so you're trying to factor in turnover luck here. So let's face it, in football, the reason I don't like turnover margin that much as a stat, especially to plug into models, is because I feel like turnover margin is a lot of luck involved. Now there are defenses that can force turnovers and there are offenses that are that bad that are gonna be turning the ball over, but for the most part, there's a lot of randomness in turnovers. So you're trying to filter out the randomness with the adjusted turnover margin. So what you're doing is assume that every fumble uh, has a 50% recovery rate and every interception, uh, you're trying to adjust that assuming that um, you calculate the pass deflection to interception ratio. So assume that that's 25% you're adjusting for a 25% uh, ratio on interceptions, right? So what you're really doing on adjusted, you can look this up by the way, that explains it in better detail than I can. But like I said, it's fa factoring out the randomness and turnovers. Assuming that every fumble is a 50% recovery rate and every interception is a interception to pass deflection ratio rate. So havoc rate uh, is basically how much the percentage of plays that an offense or defense has that results in a tackle for loss, sack, pass deflection, or interception. Those four things. OPS is uh, the synthesis of success rate and PAPP. So you, it's well, how I calculate it is just multiplying success rate times PAPP. It's kind of like OPS in baseball, which is why I call it OPS on-base plus slugging percentage. It tries to calculate the most efficient offenses who are the best overall at success rate and PAPP. That's a good stat to put into a uh, model uh, for regression. Passing downs is filtering 
a success rate or a PAPP only for plays that are considered to be passing downs, which are pretty much uh, second and long and third and long. Uh, downs that are mostly going to be expected to be a pass. Power success rate is pretty much the success rate on plays uh, that are two yards to go or less uh, on third or fourth down. I want to say that's what it is. Sack rate is just the percentage of plays that result in a sack. Second level yards is the opposite of adjusted line yards, and it's attributing how much of a rushing play can be attributed to the running back. How many of those yards are attributed to the back instead of the offensive line? Standard downs is the opposite of passing downs. It's pretty much uh, first and 10, second and five, basically downs that are non-obvious passing situations. And stuff rate is the percentage of plays that go for zero yards or less. Um, that's a good measure of offense and defensive lines, uh, a pr good proxy. But you need play-by-play -play level data for that. So special teams, uh, you can do efficiency for all five phases of special teams. Kick return efficiency is uh, what you're pretty much measuring here uh, is, you know, say you return the your average kick return goes to the 28 yard line. The league average is 25. Uh, so you're gaining three yards of expectation on kick returns. How many points are you adding over that? Same, same concept with kickoffs. Say your average kickoff uh, ends with the other team starting their drive on the 18 yard line. The league average is the 25 yard line. So minus seven yards better than average. How many points are you taking away from the other team based on that. And same with punt and punt returns. Field goal efficiency is, say you're kicking a field goal from the 50-yard line, the average kicker in college football makes 33%, but your kicker makes it 50% of the time. That's 17% better than average. How much points are you gaining because of that? So, so that's special teams. Um, I haven't calculated those yet. I don't know if I will, just because I feel like field position is such a good proxy for all that. Um, and I, I just I just think it feel like it might be duplicating efforts, but it might be something you want to track. You never know. So that is the end of the. So I hope I was able to go over some key concepts. But I know the question people ask is, can you calculate any anything meaningful without drive level data, without play by play level, data, with just box score level data? You probably could. Um, I don't know if it's going to have uh, accuracy scores or mean squared error scores on a linear regression, for example, or a um, you know any of that that's better than stats you can get out of drive level data or play by play level data. But it doesn't mean you can't try. It doesn't mean you can't get something that might work. I've always thought about doing like maybe a video series about how I try to make a good model using only box score level data for football. Like, how far can you get? I doubt you're going to get something as good as this, but I don't know. All right, I'm looking at the chat. Thoughts on Google Fi phone plan with built-in VPN? Uh, I don't know. What would you do? Try to use it to a uh, skirt location? Like, you'd be able to use the Las Vegas betting apps outside of Nevada, for example. That's what I'm guessing. That's why you would do it. Am I using a Monte Carlo sim for every game on the week schedule and multiple regression? Um, for college football, it's going to be all regression. There's going to be no Monte Carlos. No Monte Carlos. It's just too hard to do a Monte Carlo simulation for football. There's too many variables. Like, does a team run or pass? If they run, how many yards are they going to gain? Like, too many distributions. It's better just use regressions for football. Like Monte Carlo has its place in baseball and basketball, but for football, it's straight regression. So I'm, I'm going to have another video where I do this, uh, but I'm going to tune models, uh, uh, regression models, uh, gradient boost models, and ad adaptive boosting models, and a random forest model, uh, and maybe even a K nearest neighbors model to see uh, which one is the best for these stats. I will do a separate video for that. I've actually already started, uh, but... I, you know, I haven't gotten very far in it, but let me see if, you know, just for a teaser. And this is only based off of 2018 and 2019 games, by the way. Let me see if I can do this. Master Framer. This is R, by the way. 
So for 2018-2019, I trained a linear regression model, a random forest regression model, a gradient boost regression model, and a adapted boost regression model. And I'd like to add a K nearest neighbors model in there at some point. But um, basically, what I'm what I put as the Y value is a waypoint. So I filtered out only games that were non-neutral site games in 2018 and 2019. Um, and I'm trying to see which uh, of the four approaches are best for projecting the total points for the away team. And out of this, I don't know if you can even see this because it's so small on my screen. I don't know if I can zoom in or not. Um, but I'll read off the values. The linear regression did best. I'm surprised. I Although I tuned the hell out of the random forest and I tuned the hell out of the gradient boosting model, but I could not get it to be better than the linear regression for project, projecting away team score. So the p-values on away team score, the best ones were offensive field position, pace, defensive points added per play, defensive field position, and pace. So the pace uh, and field position actually were the most predictable metrics for the linear regression. But for the random forest and the gradient boost, it's actually the drive efficiency and PAPP that were predictive and not so much pace or field position. And also success rate uh, did not chart, so I took those out. But I tuned these all in linear regression best for predicting a way score. But remember, that's only for 2018 and 2019 data. Um, I would filter it all the way back down to 2014. Maybe uh, things would change. But... That's, I want to do a whole video just based on tuning models alone. Like I said, those are the plan. So in the past, if you've watched my videos, the blender was always a linear regression model. And the currencies were always uh, various tuning approaches for a nearest neighbors model. So random forest, gradient boost, and adaptive boost would be brand new concepts that I would introduce. Because remember the penny, the nickel, the dime, and all that? That was just different uh, tuning values on a K nearest neighbors model. So that's how I did it in the past, but I plan on changing it going forward. How are you doing, Grub Warp? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pro I, I wouldn't be surprised if people are confused in this video, but um, it's just meant to be a uh, one-on-one level. Um, I hope I was able to explain it in a good way. Um, but yeah, I want to do an entire video based on tuning models and determining which features matter, which ones don't. Like, I'd like to get all these secondary features uh, programmed and plug them into a model as well and see if any of them have high predictive value, like low p-values or high influential values on these gradient boost and random forest fe feature important uh, outputs. So that's what I would like to do. Anyway, that should do it for this video. Um, if no one has any more questions. Yeah. But like I said, the reason I redid this video three times for those of you who tried to watch the first two attempts is because I don't want people to just watch this live. I hope this video can be available for people to watch um, forever and tune into to see uh, advanced statistics for football. You know, you have your basic statistics like yards per carry or completion percentage, uh, yards per game, like meaning stats that are meaningless because you need context. Football is a unique sport that field position matters. Down distance and yard line all matter and you can't get that out of a box score. Um, but they have so much influence on a team's statistics, and that's why you want to go a little bit deeper like this. Anyway, have I used Havoc data? Uh, not yet. Um, I'm going to program that all in in the next week or two, and then I want to do a live stream where I'm actually tuning my models. Like, when I say tuning, I mean, you know, feature importance, trying to get the models uh, mean square error or confusion matrix score as high as possible. I want to do a live stream just for that so we can see if stats like Havoc matters uh, when creating a model to predict away team points, home team points, scoring margin, win percentage, and all of that. All right. So, um, yeah, 
I hope uh, people found this video helpful. I really do. And I will be back with more football. I'm, I'm shifting gears, you know. Yeah, I plan on doing some uh, baseball videos, like DFS videos, uh, through the rest of the month. But football, uh, I have seen my analytics. The past two years, I've had this channel up for two years now. And my views are highest during football season. That's when people are coming to my channel. So I want to shift gears and make sure we're starting to talk about football. You know, get ready for that because that's, that's my prime season for this channel. And so football is going to be the main focus starting now all the way through probably the end of the year. Yep, have havoc rate. I have havoc rate right here. Yep, it's the percentage of plays that result in a pass breakup, an interception, a fumble, a sack, or a tackle for loss. Yep. It's a, it's a good stat. Um, like I said, I'd like to see if it has a high p-value or not, a high influential value or not, when plugging it into a model. It would be fun. All right, well, that's gonna be the next uh, sequence of this series, is that I'm gonna do a model, or a video specifically for model tuning. Uh, I don't know when that will be. It'll be whenever I finish the, the model. Um, before I do preseason ratings, so I might have to do another video for preseason ratings and Outlook and whoever wanted me to do week zero uh, talk as well. Maybe on week zero I can do that. All right, guys. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, I will see you guys later with more football-related videos.